how banks magically create money. Oh, this is coming from the channel Primal Space. Guys, money used to be real. Now it's just a bunch of numbers on a screen, guys. It used to be real. It used to mean something, right? Like bring a dollar or $10, whatever it is, to the bank, and it'll give you a dollar or $10 worth of gold uh, to be used anywhere. Right? And now our U.S. dollar is basically backed on our, our military. For the most part, I'd say our might, at least. But either way, let's check it out. Let's jump into it. Uh, this is a suggestion via Discord. Every hour of every day, this government facility in Washington, D.C. turns paper into money. In order to keep up with demand, these machines are running 24-7, pumping out more than $500 million into the U.S. economy every, every day. day. Yeah. But this is only a tiny fraction of how much money is really made. Most of our money exists digitally, and this number currently goes up by more than $4 billion every day. But where does all of this money come from? Thin air. Thin air. Before it ever reached your bank account, it changed hands countless times, passing through people, governments, and businesses, all after being simply typed into existence on a computer. We modeled the entire thing to show you how money really works right, and how go. it drives the country, inflates prices, and ultimately puts you in debt. But in order to fully understand how we got to this point, we need to go back to a time before money. Okay, if a okay. farmer, thousands of years ago, needed a new tool, he'd go to the local toolmaker to buy one. The farmer didn't have anything to give him in return, so instead, they both just agreed that he owed him something in the future. Because the toolmaker trusted the farmer, his promise of future value was an acceptable form of payment. Sure enough, two weeks later, the farmer came back and gave him some food from his farm. To make transactions easier, people started to pay using more commonly used items like cattle, grain, and salt. Everyone needed these things, but they were hard to come by, and that's what made them valuable. The, scarcity of the it, farmer yeah. could now buy a tool and pay for it right away, using a precise amount of grain that seemed like a fair exchange. This made transactions Seed. quicker, and both parties would leave with something valuable to them. But eventually the demand for trade was too much, and paying with a random mix of bulky objects wasn't good enough. People eventually settled on using metal coins, like gold and silver, since they were small, extremely valuable, and would last forever, unlike cattle or grain. Suddenly, trade around the world opened up, and things were being bought and sold all the way from China to Europe. But traveling with so much gold became heavy and dangerous. This was when the whole idea of money started to change. In 17th century London, trusted goldsmiths started to take in people's gold coins, promising to look after them for a small fee. In return, they would give the customer a piece of paper, a promise note that allowed them to retrieve their gold at any time. The key to this piece of paper was that the customer could go to any goldsmith in any town and claim back that it. exact yeah. amount of gold. The paper itself had no intrinsic value, but it became as good as gold. The notes were so... That's that, uh, that's, that's where the saying came from, yeah. ...had no intrinsic value, but it became as good as gold. The notes were so convenient that people started simply exchanging them to buy and sell things. The goldsmiths realized that most people weren't actually coming to retrieve their gold, and so they started loaning out fake promise notes to customers. Guys, how much gold do you think is actually in Fort Knox? Let me know in the comments. I'm going to go ahead and say none. Instant money that had to be paid back with interest, making the goldsmiths a small profit. This was fake money that didn't actually come out of their gold supply. If a goldsmith loaned out 100 coins, they wouldn't become 100 coins poorer. They'd simply write the customer a fake note that was worth 100 coins, which could be spent anywhere. Eventually, the customer would pay back the loan plus the fee, making the goldsmith 105 coins richer. On top of that, the customer would spend their money by paying someone for goods, making them richer. From that single loan, the total money in existence increased by 100 coins, yet no new coins were produced. This meant that more money was in people's hands than actually existed. As long as everyone didn't come to cash in their notes at the same time, ev and that's how banks become insolvent, guys. everything would be fine. If we replace the goldsmiths with banks and the promise notes with digital money, we have today's system of money. Nowadays, almost everything is bought and sold digitally. But did you know that data brokers buy and sell your own do personal it. data? 
This could be used bro. against you for things like scams, identity theft, stalking, and harassment. Okay, guys, this is the code that this is the, the product that he's trying to push here. Um, all right, let's check it out. Dot com slash space and use and the code, code space at checkout to get 20% off. Right, when the 17th it. century goldsmiths started handing out fake money, it had a profound effect on the economy. Before, no new money could enter the system, and so the money that did exist was simply passed around in a cycle whenever a transaction was made. But this system had a major flaw. Imagine a group of four people who have a total of $100 between them. If person one pays person two for some food, it moves the money around, making it uneven. Then person two pays person four for a service, and the money moves again. Note that every time money is passed around, value is made and productivity grows. But eventually, the money supply becomes uneven, and less people can participate, slowing down trade and reducing productivity. This so then you make more money, and then the value of that guy's $100 uh, starts to become you know, worth less. system only works if everyone pays each other the exact same amount at the exact same time. Something that is impossible and now in the we're real in an world. Inflationary event. By adding more money into the system, it speeds up the economy, allowing businesses to grow, products to be made, and ultimately advances our civilization. And so, a constant flow of new money is crucial in our current system. But how is this actually done? We think of banks as places that store our money and keep it safe. But that's not really what's going on. When you give a bank your money, they are in debt to you. The numbers you see in your bank account aren't real wads of cash sitting in a vault. They are simply promise notes showing right. that the bank owes you money. And, and, and what do they do? They invest the money while you give it to them, making them richer than saying, hey, listen, you have $10,000 here in your bank account. We're going to give you 0.03% on your $10,000 while we're making hand over fist in the stock market, uh, about 20 to 30% returns on a yearly basis, depending on the year. That's how the banks do it. Guys, do not leave money in your bank accounts. Okay, um, like specifically, if you're trying to save like for real, d save like how they save, save in the stock market. Okay, this is not financial advice here, guys, because listen, if you don't know what you're doing, you can lose a lot of money really fast. Right? Um, I would just say stick to things that um, are base have been growing since the beginning of time. S&P 500, uh, SPY, SPYG, QQQ, bro, the NASDAQ, bro, like stick to Coca-Cola even, bro. I think even, I think as of right now, Upstart is making a gigantic push, right? But just understand, um, stick to the things that have been consistent that no matter what, even in hard times, people buy. Coca-Cola is another really good one. Pepsi even, right? Um, you know, some of the dividend kings and things like that, guys. But do not store any large quantity of money in the bank, bro, because what they're doing is what you should be doing, literally. And then, then, they're, then they're like, oh, I'm going to give you 0 0.03% uh, you know, interest on your savings account, right? Now, there are some bank accounts that actually are like high-yield savings accounts, uh, which are definitely like a good thing to do, right? But that still is, what, 4%, 3%, 5% some places, guys? Bro, they're making 20% return yearly on your, on your money. <laughs> You're not making it. What's going on here? That you can claim it back whenever you want. A loan well, is the exact same, banks. but in the opposite direction. When banks lend us money, we are in debt to them, and we have to pay them back. This is where money really gets made. Just yeah. like the goldsmiths, when a bank gives out a loan, they don't get poorer. They simply type new money into your bank account. It's brand new money that didn't exist before. The only difference is that when you pay it back, the money gets canceled out, and the bank only keeps the interest. But with that loan, you paid for a new car, and that money eventually made its way to the employees of the dealership. Then, they spent that money, and it continued to create hundreds of new transactions, powering businesses, creating new technologies, and providing us with food. All of this value and productivity would never have happened if new money hadn't entered the system. The problem is that productivity doesn't necessarily increase when we create new money, and that can cause inflation. If society starts producing fewer goods, but more money is added into the system, prices will go. go up, since there is more competition for fewer goods. Right, supply and demand, guys. Because of this, banks have to limit how much money they create. In the past, they could only lend out a portion of the actual cash they had in their backup supply. 
Nowadays, though, banks have almost complete freedom to create as much money as they like. If they are running low on backup money, they can simply go to the central bank and ask for more money. And guys, this is also another reason why you shouldn't be keeping like large quantities of money in the bank, bro. Um, the fact is, is that on a yearly basis, the bank, again, is giving you like a tiny, tiny, minuscule uh, interest rate um, while, infl while they're still printing money. Okay, so your one hundred or, or one thousand dollars you have in the bank is not the same one thousand you put in there, bro. I'm just gonna be honest here. It's probably like eight hundred, uh, based on, on on how things have been basically moving here. Um, so if you can find a way to store money in a way that allows you to kind of keep at least at the bare minimum keep up with inflation, do that. Okay, the stock market is really good for that. And that's where things get ridiculous. To create new money, the government creates a bond, which is essentially a loan that provides a steady income. Or Banks, bonds. corporations, and foreign countries buy these bonds from the U.S. government, and this influx of money goes toward the government's budget. The government uses this money to pay companies and people, and it eventually makes its way back to the banks. The problem is, the U.S. government almost always spends more money than it makes, so it is constantly in debt to those that buy bonds. In order to pay for that debt, it uses the taxpayers' money. Last year, the government spent almost $7 trillion, but your tax money wasn't enough to pay for this. And so the government had to create new bonds to receive more money. Putting yeah, but people, were, people for the last couple of years actually slowed down on buying our bonds, guys. Like, large scale. This is not happening at the same rate. This. And so the government had to create new Anymore. bonds to receive more money, putting it further in debt, and the cycle continues. As crazy as it sounds, this system of adding more money through debt is how most of the world operates. It isn't necessarily a bad system. It's just not running anywhere near maximum efficiency. If banks created money for more productive things, like businesses, education, and infrastructure, all of this money going into the system could give us higher returns in the long run. Absolutely. And now, time for the Primal Space giveaway. The winner of the previous... All right, guys. Uh, ooh. This is actually a very, very well put together video here. Like, I love talking finance. I talk, we talk finance all day long here, guys. Now people are wasteful. Right, and talk about our, our absolutely terrible interest rate that we're currently sitting at. Um, for a while, I've kind of been like, you know what? I can't wait for it to drop because it's, that's just me being selfish. I'll, I'll be honest. I want the interest rates to drop um, so I can kind of dabble a little harder in commercial real estate um, because I just don't really, really want to put my toes in there um, in its current state. Um, but also at the same time, if I'm if I'm talking about it, then the actual like billionaires out there are going to be like, oh, wait, the interest rate drop free money. Okay, so just I understand and then that will honestly that that'll seriously wreck the economy right now Like with how people are still spending like think guys Jerome Powell basically stated guys if you want him to lower the interest rates stop spending Seriously, like you want to fix things tomorrow. Tell your friend to tell your friend. Okay, stop putting things on a credit card Because what that's telling the Federal Reserve is that oh that 30% interest rate or 28% crazy interest rate on credit cards right now People are fine with it, so they're still using their credit card. So why would we lower it, <laughs> right? Um, things have to get hard before they get good, okay? Um, and so if you really want to fix this inflationary event we're in, stop buying things. It's just stop spending money on unnecessary things. I'm telling you, what will, what will force what will be forced to happen is okay. Um, everyone that is selling a product or a service would have to come back down to reality because no one is buying it at all. Again, supply and demand works all around for everything, okay, for everything. You want the prices to drop, stop buying it because if you keep buying it, they're not going to stop because you're buying it, <laughs> okay? It's completely fine. It's not overly priced or expensive. How could it be? They're buying it, right? All of these, all of these credit cards are making record profits because people won't stop buying in an inflationary event. But all right. Listen, I get it. We're consumers. We want to have everything immediately. You want to fix the problem? Stop spending, bro. That's it. That's how it works. Stop. You don't. Do you? Are you sure you need that right now on credit? And specifically, if you're going to hold the balance, like don't buy if you have to hold the balance. I know that's easier said than done in this context here, guys. But don't buy if you have to hold the balance past the statement date. 
because you're just giving them free money. Guys. All right, don't listen to me. I'm just a random guy on the internet. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help your pockets. You want to fix it? You want to fix what's going on right now? Stop buying things. They have to, they'll have to lower the prices on everything. But either way, listen, you guys all have an absolutely amazing day. Enjoy your day thoroughly. The fact that you just made it to the end of the video says a whole lot, actually. Uh, we have a couple other channels. Uh, Mr. Al Boyd Music, Mr. Al Boyd Movie Reacts, along with Mr. Al Boyd Discusses, where I just generally speak about the things that specifically matter to me. But in the meantime, I'll catch you guys later.